so just to introduce myself, my name is Wei Liang. I work at Engage Rocket together with Ted, who is my colleague. We clearly collaborated on coming here today together. Uh, what? What is this? All right. So I like to start off by saying I'm not an expert on Rails engines. I'm still learning. That's why the title is Learning about Rails engines. <laughs> so I'd like to invite anyone who knows more about this to interrupt me whenever I say something that is wrong or ask any questions that maybe we as a group can try and answer. So the first thing is, what are Rails engines? So to answer this question, um, in an easy way, a Rails engine is a Rails app that you put inside another Rails app. Um, on a very high level, basic idea. To go a bit deeper as an example, device is actually, you can understand as a Rails engine. Uh, when you use device, you have to create a model, the user authenticated model, but you don't need to write the controllers, you don't need to write the views, it works. Right? You can override the controllers and the views, but you don't have to create your own. All you have to do is just put this thing in your routes file and it's supposed to work. Right. Yeah. So if you look in the source code, and I tell you, I only look in the source code because I wanted to get it to work the way I wanted it to, not the way it did out of the box, you realize it has an app folder inside of which there's a controllers folder and a views folder and all the stuff that you find in a normal Rails app. And of course, there's some gem file stuff um, in there as well. So this is telling you that Rails engines, more specifically, are gems that contain Rails apps that you can plug into other Rails apps. And Rails engines must be gems. Okay. So I have an aside now. Uh, what makes a Ruby gem to Rails engine? Because clearly not all Ruby gems are Rails engines. Uh, some of them are clearly not. They just don't work in Rails, right? So they don't have to be a Rails engine. So I try to visualize this. Um, in Ruby land, we have many Rails apps. Most of our code actually are gems. Some of these gems are these things we call Rails plugins. And some of the Rails plugins are called Rails engines. Rails plugins actually existed a long time ago, but uh, they've changed now. And uh, Okay, so yeah, I forgot my flow. This is a Ruby gem. Uh, basically, a Ruby gem needs to fulfill two requirements, basically needs to have a gem spec file, needs to have a lib folder, um, basically. So once you have a gem like this, and this is an example pulled off of the Ruby Gems website, um, a hypothetical gem called Hola, you would, after installing this gem, be able to write require Hola inside your Ruby code, and that would require the lib hola.rb file into your Ruby program. Um, that's basically it. That's all a gem is. Um, I think everyone knows what a Ruby gem is. So just an update, uh, a PSA, because I looked into Ruby gems uh, because of this. There were vulnerabilities that were detected, and so Ruby gems website asks you to update to the latest version, which you should be doing regularly. But if you're not, uh, there was one that just was found out in the February this year. So run this command and Commit your gem file locks if you commit your gem file locks. Next question, what is a Rails plugin? This is the other thing that I mentioned, right? Rails plugin is a type of gem. On a very high level, a plugin is a way to extend Rails, basically. If you want the Rails string to not work like a Rails string, or you want to add new things to the Rails string, uh, because you feel that this should have been in active support or whatever, you can create a Rails plugin. So not Ruby plugin, my title is wrong. And then you can monkey patch or add new stuff into Rails. Right? And then a plugin is also a gem. You create a plugin in a very similar way you create a new Rails app. There's a command called Rails plugin new. And then you type in the name of the plugin. Right? So, so far, so good. Most people are not going to create Rails plugins unless you're a core team. You're part of the Rails core team. So if you go back, this is primarily for people to test out Rails features before actually committing them to Rails core. Um, gem that extends Rails. Rails engine. Come back here. A Rails engine 
according to the Rails Guides page, is I put the wrong URL there. Let me change that. Um, basically, a type of Rails plugin in that you also create it the same way, but actually it's a mini Rails app, as we were as I was talking about just now. So you do run the Rails plugin new command, but you pass in the full option or mount mountable option. And in this way you create a new Rails engine. There is also a gem. And so when if you publish this gem, you can then include this gem into your other Rails apps and then have this Rails app inside your Rails app. So in sum, a Rails engine is a gem that contains a Rails app that you can plug into another Rails app. Which is exactly, if you think about it, what device is. Device gives you routes, controllers, views. You just need to create that model which you can customize. And that sort of works inside the device Rails engine. Of course, device is more complicated than that, but we'll not go there. Why would you care about Rails engines? So this is, this is where I, I'm making value judgments here. I think there are only two reasons why you might care. The first reason is you're writing something like device. You, you're writing a library or a uh, utility thing that you, you want to share and allow people to reuse across Rails projects. The second reason, and the reason why I, go, I looked into it, was that um, the product requirements uh, demanded that we're going to build a whole new module that is supposed to work sort of independently from our current module. Uh, but we didn't want to complicate our DevOps. We kind of wanted it to be in the same Rails app instance. Um, so basically, a Rails engine is a way for you to create, in a sense, multiple Rails apps inside a Rails app. Yeah. So uh, you can imagine there'll be some issues with that, um, which I'll talk about in a moment. But this is the one we chose because we, we wanted to uh, get past some of the logistical problems with having to build a whole new module. Um, so basically what we did, we created, we ran the plugin new uh, command, which is a Rails generator, it generates a whole bunch of files. We put that into our main app slash engines directory. We created this directory, it's new. And then we basically mounted this engine. So in your routes file, you mount the engine. What this does is any routes that are inside the engine become available to your main app at this uh, URL subpath. And then what you need to do in your main app's gem file, main, remember the Rails engine is a gem. So you need to make sure your Rails app loads this gem. So Bundler has this syntax that allows you to include a gem by specifying the path to a local directory that contains the gem. So this is what we do. And with that, basically, you can start going into there and start creating models and controllers and views and all that stuff, and it's supposed to work um, as if it was just another app mounted at this URL, basically, which works for the most part. Um, yeah. So these are things you should know. First thing is you will learn in the documentation that you have this file, uh, which is the configuration file, the equivalent of config slash application.rb in your main Rails app. This is the engine version. Um, you have this line that you will want there called isolate namespace. What this does, and you need to know what this does. It doesn't do everything for you, but it makes sure that in your engine code, if you refer to a path helper in your routes, that will refer to your engine routes. So for example, if I have a post uh, controller in my engine, and I refer to the post path inside my engine code, that will refer to the engine's post path and not the post path of my main Rails app if it happens to have also a post path uh, helper. That being said, if your engine does not have a post path and your main app does, in your engine code, you can still refer to a post path which will link to your main Rails app's post path. So <laughs> stuff can leak through this boundary between your engine and the normal, your main Rails app, basically. Um, second thing, model associations will assume a namespace, provided you use isolated namespace. What that means is, I'll show you an example, I think. Um, if you say a post has many comments, it's going to look for a model called 
comments under the namespace of your Rails engine. Um, so example is there. The second, the last thing is that if you use the Rails generators, Rails generate model, etc., inside the directory of your Rails engine, it will generate the namespaced versions of those classes. So everything becomes a namespace, and this is the way that Rails engine separates itself from your main Rails apps code. Okay. Uh, so as an example, and this is one of the implications of the namespacing thing. If you have a model called post inside your Rails engine, and as a side effect, uh, this is the full URL because I have slash engine slash Rails engine name, and then I have a slash app slash models folder inside of it, and I have a slash engine name again because of the, the namespace on my model, and then slash post.rb, right? Um, this is the class name, I have the namespace there. And then if I define has many comments, I have to specify a foreign key sub app post ID. Why? Because if you use isolate namespace and all this stuff, your namespace classes will look for a database table with that prefix as well. You look for the sub post prefix database table. So your Rails migrations will have that prefix in your database tables as well, which is how the database tables don't conflict between your engine and your Rails app. Um, if you look into active storage, this is a, there's an example in there, it's a great example, because active storage, um, to use active storage, you need to create two new database tables, and they, they all prefix with active, I believe, I th not, sure, not sure if active support, but I believe active is in, the, in, is in there. Um, yeah, so in controllers, controllers have the same uh, namespace thing, and, and here, I'm, the, the point of this illustration is that you, the two syntax uh, forms of namespacing uh, classes, right? You have the qualified namespace. So when you define a class, it should be lowercase c, my bad. You have the namespace, double colon, and then the, the controller name. Or you could do module, the namespace, and then class name. The implication is how you refer to any namespace constants inside. Um, you cannot do this form if you do that module form. Because if you do, you will encounter Rails auto-loading uh, problems, constant auto-loading problems, which I will not get into today because it's a whole other can of worms. Yes. Basically, choose one if you, would, if you are doing a Rails engine. Basically, the first one creates a set of unique namespaces. Okay, you <coughs> sub app posts controller is is not in the same namespace as say sub app users controller. Yeah. But at runtime, Rails auto loading figures out how they're supposed how they're supposed to do things. If you're in normal Ruby land and you want to coexist with Ruby outside Rails, always, 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 always use the second form. Yes. Or you will suffer. <laughs> yes. Okay. So the first form only works in Rails. The first form only works reliably in Rails. Yes. Um, which is why if you look into gems, you will not see this form. If you look in device, they will not use that form. They will use the second form. Um, and that's to do with module nesting and stuff like that. So the second thing, well, this is just an explanation of the previous one, but there, there was an old problem uh, called the top level constant reference problem, which is now gone. But if you are not in Ruby 2.5, you will be able to do weird shit like this. Yes. Uh, forever. You could continue string, double colon hash, double colon string, double colon hash, all and on and on and on uh, until you're done, and then you will still get the top level thing. Right. Which is a problem in Rails because you do auto load constants, right? Um, now, Ruby 2.5, you don't have that. So please upgrade to Ruby 2.5 <laughs> so we don't have to deal with that shit. <laughs> because let me tell you, this is the worst shit to debug, right? If you have a if you're using Rails engines, okay, your main Rails app has a post model, your engine has a post model, you call your post model in your engine, 
and it somehow thinks that it's the main Rails app's post model. Or you really want to fuck with your mind, create an engine without a posts model, but your app has a posts model. Right. <laughs> Get that working, and then add a posts model inside your engine. <laughs> you will drive yourself batshit. Yeah. Anyway. The story is basically that this this doesn't happen in real stu Ruby twenty five. Engines, are engines, okay. Well, <laughs> I I have no comment on that yet. Um, but anyway, this is something to know about if you're not on Ruby two point five. Uh, the next thing you know is about routing and path helpers. So specifically in specs, because if you write R spec specs, um, your engines path helpers are not available by default, which is normally what we get in a normal Rails app uh, controller specs. You have to include this line, routes, uh, curly braces, and, and that will include your engine's routes, basically, and the path helpers in there. That's the controller specs. Now, if you're writing a spec for a plain old Ruby object that needs path helpers inside, because you do the include stuff, um, the way to do that in the spec is to include the same thing, but dot mounted helpers. I actually couldn't find documentation about this. I figured this out by trial and error. So you're welcome. Um, okay, the next thing to know is that all classes are available on both sides. So if you run the Rails console from the main app, you can reference the engines classes. And uh, the second part is in your engines code, you can reference the main app's code. So if you wrote your controller like that and you inherited from application controller, you are inheriting from your main Rails apps application controller, not your engine's application controller, should that matter in your case. So um, yeah, definitely something to know. OK, so what do I think? I think uh, it has been a convenient way to separate code. Um, it's not about its issues. But it works for us if you are willing to deal with the problems. There are other problems that I haven't mentioned, which include configuration. If you use any gems that do configuration in your main Rails app in some initializer, for example, device, and you're using device in your Rails engine as a dependency, and your engine requires different device configurations than your main Rails app, it won't work. You can't do that, OK? Because the device will load your main Rails app's uh, device configuration, not your engine's one, right? So that's not going to work. Um, and, and you can think about certain cases where this is important, like if you do uh, file uploads and you need to configure your paperclip configuration or whatever it is if you're using paperclip. Um, the second thought is that in our case, we are everything is in one repository. Right? That means that in GitHub, in the pull request tab, you will see pull requests for both the main Rails app and the Rails engine, and any other Rails engine in that repository. Which means that you need a way to manage your pull requests um, per Rails engine or application-wide uh, pull requests. So what we did is we had, we had a PR label, which is relatively simple to do, but it relies on the human being who made the pull request to remember to put the PR label onto the PR. Yes. Um, yeah. So those are my thoughts. Um, I believe that's it. Thank you. Uh, Any questions? Yes. Comments? Yeah. Do you have uh, uh, any uh, lesson learns uh, you can share for deploying such app, releasing to a production? Deploying is not an issue. Deploying is not an issue. The main issues are everything I've just talked about, which are getting the thing to work. If you can deploy your app without an engine, you can deploy your app with an engine. Yeah. Yeah. How about like upgrading? Your subsystem, and, and then you need to release the whole thing. Then you need to you upgrade it like you upgrade any other gem dependency. Yeah, folder. Release as a folder. Basically, you treat it as one big app. Yeah. Um, and so your releases have to be for the whole app and not 
the subsystem right. level. Right, right. Yeah. Also, going back to the example you just uh, quoted with paperclip, uh, PSA for everybody who didn't get see who didn't see the notice. Paperclip is now deprecated. They are officially recommending that people use active storage. Yeah. So yeah. What, um, so how many months did it take you to figure all that out? <laughs> Actually, it didn't take very long. Um, I don't know what that says about us, but uh, it didn't take very long. So it, we got it to a working level in, in a couple of weeks, two weeks. Oh and we could yeah. start building controllers and models and build, well, basically adding value, business value to the product. Um, not that we were happy about it. <laughs> no, you're never going Everything. to be happy. Right. Uh, I'll tell you that, uh, so we chose this form, right? Yes. Doing this, which means that everywhere we reference the class, we need to put the, the namespace, which gets annoying at first, but after a while, you just get used to it. There's a subconscious value about this in that when you look at the class name in the code, you, it's a signal to you that you're working inside the Rails app and not you know, some other Rails engine. Um, so I personally prefer that syntax. Although you, so going back a bit, this one, if you chose this module uh, nesting form, you can still do sub app post. Uh, it would still work. It's just that you could do this, and so you'll be tempted to do that, and so you do that. Um, and, it, and it follows the fallback rules. Yes, it follows the fallback rules. Yep. I might have missed this, but do you have a spec folder inside your engine? Which is the engine isolation with artists and people that have the engine to Yes, we do. And so there, are even test fra there are even test frameworks specifically for engines. The one day one that I've used and recommend is called Combust. Yeah. So we didn't use any framework besides mm -hmm. the normal Rails framework. So as far as we, we yeah. work, our Rails engine has a spec folder just like our main Rails app, and it works exactly like, like the main Rails app. Except that when you want to run the specs, you have to do our spec space the, the directory path to that folder right. if you're running the specs from your main Rails app root directory. I might have missed it, but like you mentioned there's a business requirement that made you go through the whole engine uh, approach. What was it? Because like, normally, like, I understand why you would want to release device, but that's like a public. But from what you said, you just want the you know, private code base that you can use as a dependency for the um, So personally, I haven't wrapped my head around it 100%. Um, in terms of, is this a good thing, good way to do it. Uh, I think there's, there's people sitting on both sides of the fence on whether Rails engines are a good way to organize your code into modules, basically. Basically, what Rails engines do is you can uh, organize your application code into modules that work in isolation from one another, right? But do you have like another app that you were using that is depending on this, or like you just... Yeah. No. So we just have one big, one big uh, Rails repository right now. So, what was, so like, I guess what was wrong with just having like a Rails app instead of having one engine? This would be a, a mess, right? Um, basically, what? We, okay, I don't know how much. <laughs> um, okay, the idea was to organize it according to the sub modules. So that it was easier to maintain in that if we wanted to work on one of the modules, we don't really have to care that it's interacting in any way with the other modules. Um, Can you give me a specific example of the module you're using? Um, so, okay, so, so essentially we're building several products that are not related to each other other than they're used by the same Companies so mm -hmm. think a product suite like uh, uh, Google Google Suite. So there is some strategic reuse, uh, mm -hmm. but we don't we don't have any dependencies in between products other than those shared dependencies. Right, you want to be able to evolve the components and so, so, so instead of putting say 500 models into that one Rails app, 
don't uh, <laughs> we decided to go with the engines because it also allows us to maintain a, a unidirectional dependency graph. Yes. So we don't create circular dependencies or Thank accidentally you. create dependencies between the, the products. Mm -hmm. uh, so when we run the tests for one of the products, we will only load these dependencies and nothing else. So that if we accidentally create the dependencies, we don't want the tests to run. I'll just comment that we, on, our, on one of our now legacy projects, we made engines work reasonably well. But the next major attention that that project received, the engine was the justification for moving to a message bus. Yes, this is the sort of the so that antithesis to microservices, which comes with its own. So <laughs> that we well, n not not That's even just not technically not even just microservices because there really wasn't any discovery involved. Uh, mm -hmm. You just knew had application main application A and components B and C, and A always talked to B and C over the bus. B and C never, B and C had no clue that each other existed. Mm -hmm. Okay, they were in complete isolation. They were, uh, once we broke them out from the engine, they were completely independently versioned and developed and maintained. So the, as long as you're running, as long as you're running the major version of either B or C that A expects, It'll work just fine. Uh, Simver is a Simver will save your ass if you let it. Um, yeah, so this is, there's a lot to say about this decision, um, but in, at the point in time, this was we felt the right decision because right. if we wanted to pull it out as a Rails engine, we could pull it out into a separate app or right. or other thing. We've already got it in a gym, so right. taking it further out is pretty easy. Exactly. Yeah. So this was an intermediate step to, right. you know. Sure. Yeah. Sure. So that was the, the, the high level strategy. Yeah. Did, um, you, did you have your issues? Did you have issues with version, version control, uh, versioning of gems used inside the engine as well as the main app? Ooh, yeah. So for now, <laughs> no. <laughs> well, now no, because our engine uses the same gems as the real main Rails app. Uh, we haven't encountered those problems yet. So I, I consider it a bit of a feature that this discourages you from creating snowflakes. So if you have seven products, ideally you don't want seven completely different products, so you have, don't have any uh, developer mobility. Right. What are our solution to that, by the way, for the ABC scenario? <coughs> was we actually had a do nothing, a, a do nothing gem D that had all our dependencies. Okay, we depended uh, a B and C depended on D, and A A had similar dependencies on B and C. So as long as we kept D consistent, we were good to go. Maybe you should give a real stop. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, uh, yeah, I, I, one of these. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so, sorry to run, Sorry to keep it. No, no, it's okay. Um, this is my point that I titled this talk "Learning About Rails Engines After Much Deliberation," <laughs> uh, because. I am still learning, and I think most of us are, because Rails Engines is, is this strange thing uh, most people don't know about or know to use. And maybe that's why some people don't think it's the right thing, because maybe it's the wrong way. They're using it the wrong way, right? It's like you can use Rails the wrong way, and then it becomes a big mess, and you like, hate Rails because of that. It may not be the tool. Maybe it's just how you're using the tool, right? So um, maybe this should have been a panel thing. I don't know. <laughs> but yeah, anyway, that was the talk. Um, Happy to talk more about anything Rails Engines. Um, yeah, thank you. <laughs>